Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Transforming Culture and Instructional Practice at Butler Community College, Avid for Higher Education's Deep and Lasting Influence. My name is Kayla Burrow, and I'll be one of your moderators for today. Before we get started, I want to cover a little housekeeping. All participants are in listen-only mode, so if you'd like to communicate with us or ask a question, please use the chat box. I'll be keeping an eye on that throughout the presentation. Uh, ask any questions that you have in the chat as they come to you so I can collect those for the Q&A portion at the end of this webinar. A recording of today's presentation along with the slide deck and other resources will be emailed out to you next week. So don't worry about capturing everything as you listen today. Now I'd like to turn things over to Rob Jara. Rob is uh, the retired Executive Vice President of AVID Center, but thankfully he still lends his talents to the AHE team. Rob? Thanks for joining us. I'm pleased to represent AVID Center today, the nonprofit that guides AVID's work across the U.S. and the world, including our AVID for Higher Ed efforts. We've been implementing AVID for Higher Education for about 10 years now, focusing on student success and teacher preparation. Today we're going to be talking about student success, uh, but if you had questions about teacher prep, we can also provide information on that. Our work is now approaching about 60 campuses across the United States, uh, divided almost evenly between community colleges and four-year institutions, helping create student-ready campuses. Our objectives for today, for the webinar, we want you to learn about the transformational work at Butler Community College, especially around faculty development. We want you to understand connections to Butler's key initiatives, such as guided pathways, accel their accelerated learning co-requisite model. And we certainly want to address your questions via the chat box. Now I'd like to welcome our team from Butler Community College, Corey Tubner, Associate Professor of English and Chair of the Leadership Studies and Personal Development at Butler, Mark Jarvis, Director of Faculty Development, and Kathy McCoskey, English Professor and the Lead for Developmental Education at Butler in English. And with that, I'll turn it over to Corey. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, first, I'll just say that these last five years at Butler have been really exciting. We have a whole slew of new initiatives, and AVID has really underpinned and supported them in really important ways, and it's exciting to be able to tell you about it. Um, first, though, you should uh, know a thing or two about our school. But I'm having trouble advancing the slide. There. Uh, we have approximately 9,200 students. We are a, uh, at heart, we're a rural community college situated in El Dorado, uh, about 40 minutes outside of the Wichita metropolitan area. Uh, and we've been around since 1927, but for the last 20 or 25 years, we've had a big footprint in Andover, a city right on the edge of Wichita that serves a kind of commuting campus purpose there for uh, re residents of that county. We have about 160 full-time faculty here. We're the second largest community college in Kansas, and we have a five-county service area. During uh, our recent Sorry, I'm having trouble advancing the slides for some reason. Over the course of the last five years, we have transformed some really important aspects of our institution in really successful ways. A lot of these initiatives correspond, or their genesis corresponds, with our first partnership with AVID. Um, in 2013, when we signed on as part of a grant that helped fund an AVID site team and also some research studies that helped us uh, understand exactly how AVID was impacting each of our various initiatives. We had started an, a series of early college academies in fall of 2011, but it's worth mentioning here because uh, in 2013 or beginning in 2013, those early college academies, which just to be clear, allow high school students to complete an associate's degree at the same time they complete their diploma, became uh, infused with AVID teaching strategies so that most teachers teaching in the early college academies had had some exposure to AVID faculty development. Um, in 2013, our faculty development 
began a major transformation that uh, has amounted over, you know, in the intervening years to more or less a culture change in the way we approach teaching instruction here, teaching and instruction here. About the same time, we started our accelerated learning program in English. That came to full scale in the fall of 2016 so that it serves all dev ed students in English. Um, and uh, as Kathy will tell you in a little while, we have used uh, teaching, you know, a, a reformed teaching approach to help students dramatically improve their likelihood of passing Comp 1 in their first semester. Our recent math redesign is deeply avidized, as we like to say it as well. And now we're in our first semester uh, of a pathways institutional reorganization that uh, in important respects uh, rests on a first year seminar class that's the newest incarnation of a, an avid uh, oriented course that we started uh, piloting in 2013. And I'll be happy to tell you more about that in a minute. We have uh, several, we've, we've worked really hard to quantify and keep track of how these uh, programs have been impacted by all the various changes that are happening at Butler. Um, here are a few key markers of success that we are very proud of. For one, um, in the Gibson study, which AVID helped sponsor and support, we found that all of Butler's participating students reported noticing that they were involved in more peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and also that they were um, exhibiting improved critical thinking. Um, our developmental English students are 20% more likely to complete college composition in their first semester. We have uh, an average of 24% improvement in fall-to-fall -fall retention among some of Butler's most struggling students who have taken this, um, this AVID first-year experience course that I'll tell you more about in a minute. And uh, a lot of that has been possible because we were able to channel AVID teaching strategies through professional development that was gradually becoming uh, more robust and complete at the same time. Uh, in fact, that's a really good starting point because faculty development has been a conduit through which we have spread AVID strategies and brought about the culture change I'm talking about. And Mark Jarvis, our Director of Faculty Development, can tell you now about um, what that is like at Butler. Yeah, so um, I'll give you a little bit of context initially. Uh, faculty development, when I came on board, uh, when we started changing things up, was not very robust. It was a lot of sit and get. It was a lot of uh, death by PowerPoint. And, and, and faculty were uh, not too thrilled about that. Um, we did have some active learning, some pockets here and there, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't really welded together, and there didn't seem to be any um, way for us to express that across campus. So I think what's changed more than anything else, you'll see there to see change like in the verb, and we really do want you and we want everyone to see how things have evolved at Butler. And really what's happened is a, a true sea change or culture shift, I think. And um, the way it happened here at Butler is, well, we found a way to meet a need. The problem was, like I said, that uh, our in-service was uh, defective, for example. So, you know, if you were to stop and think for a minute at your institution and what's ailing you um, in terms of faculty development, I don't know what it might be, but, but just dwell on that for a minute. Or five seconds. And what I would say, <laughs> is uh, at our school, we had a lot of people that were disenchanted and skipping in service and so on and so on. And so, so that's what was uh, happening for us. And then uh, we had this, uh, so I was hired on board, we, we set up a team, we got a lot of energy around it, and we also had this infusion from AVID. So altogether, it was this perfect storm of big problems, some high energy people, and some great equipment to make things happen. So a little bit about what happened. Um, first and foremost, I would, I would offer that uh, the average teaching strategies and methodology has really underpinned all of this. And you can see 
there on this slide, this uh, book, we call it the Black Book, among other things, but the High Engagement Practices for Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, just this huge, like, I believe there's something around 150 or 200 uh, strategies and techniques in this book, and it's a compilation of just great material that we have really anchored all of our training around for years. What that's allowed us to have is a common uh, vocabulary and a toolbox that everybody can pull into and, and converse over. And, uh, and then you'll also see in the uh, bottom corner there an illustration wicker. This is a, uh, what we hang uh, all of our strategies on, basically. So a wicker stands for writing, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading. And um, these five pillars of Abbott are, um, are how we structure all of our training. So the, the best thing about it perhaps is that it's based on research and it's not just uh, happenstance. We're not just uh, making up the material as we go. And that's built a lot of confidence amongst uh, people at Butler. Abbott also is a big champion of the whole institution um, engagement in these things. And we found that it's worked very well at our institution to engage uh, um, student lives, deans, and so on and so on, the library. And so we've had uh, the, whole, the whole institution engaged in our training. And we've tried to just infuse everything from uh, department meetings to uh, councils and committees and so on and so on with uh, active learning, active engagement whenever it's been a, a thing that we could do. So the next several slides have a lot of um, stunning numbers, perhaps, but um, I'm just going to kind of run through some of the things that happened and explain how they're relevant in this conversation. So um, a good number of our faculty, I'd say probably two-thirds of our faculty have been involved in one way or another in EdCamp. And EdCamp is a national initiative. It's not necessarily an avid thing, but it's a really organic uh, professional development get together where you, you take a big marker board and mark it up. Everybody signs up for pledges to do this and that kind of quick workshops. And then you have a lot of these going at a time. So like four or five or 10, depends on how big your event is, rooms of workshops going at a time and people then migrate from room to room. And so everybody has a voice. It's very democratic and we really like using an EdCamp model because it gives, um, everyone an opportunity to testify about things that they're doing in their discipline and strategies that they've uh, been successful with. And it's just been a great chance for people to come together around pedagogy. Um, we've uh, also done quite a lot of these uh, on the other panel. You'll see 3,000 and some hours of uh, professional development on weekends. And these are generally on Saturdays. We do about six of these a year. We're doing one tomorrow. And we generally have around 40 or 50 people show up, and we have two strands of workshops all day long. So um, if you were to harken back to our first slide, it's kind of the universal truth for all of our content, and that is that we equip one another. So uh, at EdCamp, at Second Saturday, at everything we do, we try to make certain that faculty are leading faculty. And those things have created a big, uh, a big surge of enthusiasm but just the enthusiasm alone wouldn't be enough if we didn't have a lot of this uh, great material to build on. So the next thing is uh, Summer Jam. And uh, you can see 152 faculty have completed Summer Jam. Remember, Corey said our full-time faculty was somewhere around 160, so we've definitely reached a tipping point, and then some of full-time and adjunct faculty who have participated in this. It's a, it's a week long. Uh, event. And uh, you can go to the next slide. So five days of uh, seven or eight hours a day of training. And, and, uh, and the, the thing about that summer jam experience is that it's uh, high energy, high engagement from beginning to end. We are entirely staffed nowadays by our own internal uh, trainers and our own faculty and, and uh, it's peer-to-peer -peer instruction. Um, however, Again, it's, it's, it's rooted in that uh, black book. It's, uh, it's chock full of teaching strategies. In fact, we have a handout we give out called uh, uh, Techniques This Week. And the first year we did it, we had around 30 techniques we packed into those five days. And 
Um, so we not only like talk about things that flip through the book, but we actually put them into practice. So it's a, a lively, high engagement, high energy event. But I'll tell you another thing about it that's made it really powerful is we brought in uh, occasionally outside guests from Abbott on site support folks that come in who have uh, a wealth of experience and knowledge. The first uh, big surge of that was, um, what year was that? 15. In 2015, we brought in an avid trainer, uh, Deb Shapiro, who was able to uh, lead us through a, a full day of, of, of concentrated uh, material on learning communities. And learning communities have been a real powerful stratagem for us to work with in some of the jam practicum and elsewise. And, and on throughout everything we've done, what Abbott has brought us is a, a, a level of credence and credibility and just a real shot in the arm for the things that we've um, brought about. On this slide, you can see that uh, we try to approach uh, our mm, um, culture exposure with faculty from day one. We try to um, orient them and um, infuse them with high engagement, active learning in our orientations and institutes from the very, very beginning. And uh, part of that even includes the interview process where we uh, are ferreting out who might be a good fit for our institution. All together, on the next slide, you can see uh, that uh, we peaked over 18,000 hours this uh, spring, and, and now we're up over 20,000 hours of direct impact seat time training. And this is um, almost all by election by people that are interested and enthusiastic about what we do. Again, through it all, we practice what we preach, our tenets of teach, tech, and care, which is really a big thing for our faculty development team. Um, is uh, is integral to what we're all about, but we also um, are very much about peer-to-peer -peer instruction all the way through. And so uh, those things in mind, um, the other thing I would mention that's, that's extra to Butler, uh, but very much Avid is the Avid Summer Institute. Uh, over the years, we've spent around 30 faculty all together uh, and staff, uh, deans, directors, student life, admissions, uh, to, a, to Dallas or Denver or wherever it might be for the given year for a three-day intensive training. So between that and Summer Jam and all this other content, uh, we've really made a dramatic difference in our institution. Um, both Corey and Kathy have experienced virtually all of this, and uh, Kathy's up to that next to talk to you about uh, to, uh, ALP. All right. Thank you, Mark. So I'm here to talk about Accelerated Learning Program, which is an English uh, program for developmental students. We've had great success with it. Um, it was um, piloted at Butler in spring of 2013. Um, it was originated by Peter Adams at Balt uh, Community College of Baltimore County. And we've had quite a bit of training um, from him and also by going to conferences led by his team. Um, ALP is a co-requisite model. Uh, developmental English students enroll in their developmental course and the college level English course in the same term. And this has really been a national movement to uh, redesign developmental education courses to get people through faster and more effectively and succeed. So you may have heard about how that is um, been sweeping the country the last uh, probably seven to ten years. And um, this is one of those big models. Um, ALP involves 12 students um, per composition class. And so in, at Butler, we have Fundamentals of English as our developmental course. And 12 of those students are in a composition class of 25. So they make up about half of that composition course. And they attend English Comp 1 first in the day. And then after that, they go to Fundamentals of English with the same instructor. And we usually go ahead and change rooms so that there's some movement kind of a, a mind shift there. Um, and this, this schedule mixes the levels together um, and in the higher course and then gives students in the fundamentals course more time together and with the instructor. And I just wanted to emphasize that ALP instructors are trained in strategies that are really anchored in the literature skills. And I thought it would be helpful just to review those. It, it is for me, writing, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading. And, 
Boy, we really use all those in the app program. It's very much part of our training and our courses. So avid teaching methods really do fuse naturally with help. Um, it was really a great kind of a perfect storm when these two things came to our campus and started at the same time, about the same time. Uh, the success that Butler has seen really uh, mirrors what's happened nationally in the country for the accelerated learning program, and that is that developmental English students are 20% more likely to be successful in Composition One than students outside the program. And they complete it in half the time. So um, our dean uh, often likes to liken this to, if you had a medicine to give the sick person, why wouldn't you offer it to that person, right? Not that developmental English students are sick people, don't get me wrong, but uh, why would we use a different method if a 20% improvement happens? That's, that's an incredible jump, and we've seen it at Butler. So I wanted to talk a little bit about a community of practice. So if you could think about um, piggybacking on what Mark talked about, about how faculty are developed and mentored and trained, um, think about in your, your individual unit. Uh, for my example, it would be the English department, and specifically the out program. Um, how are instructors trained, developed, supported, or are they? Well, with this program, we had a unique opportunity to um, do specific training and supporting and mentoring. And we call that our ALP community of practice. What happens in our Butler ALP community of practice is we do use uh, Wicker methods as a major focus. Um, and how we do that, uh, large group meetings. So once a semester, we have a large group training collaboration meeting where we're um, sharing uh, strategies that we're learning, we're, we're trying to get better at learning. For example, we had a meeting just a couple weeks ago, and for the large group activity that we had that day, I used the um, World Cafe model and just kind of changed it up a little bit. So there I was modeling using that and kind of with a twist, and then um, within that activity, we were talking about teaching out and how we could, how we could improve different aspects of it. Um, so we do, uh, we, we practice what we preach um, in those large group meetings. Um, also, we have small group mentoring groups, and so those are uh, probably five or six faculty led by an expert ALP instructor who is mentoring them, um, just leading discussions, um, helping them uh, with challenges like uh, difficult students or students who are just having a difficult time, um, non-cognitive issues, how to deal with those, and so that small group focus is really important. And then also peer teaching observation. This is something that was started actually in faculty development, which we call the teaching squares. And now we're, we're using that in the out program where we watch each other uh, teach and we set that up with each other. And it's really just a peer-to-peer -peer observation to gain things from each other and to encourage each other and kind of up our game. You know, it, it really does make me work harder when you have someone there watching. Um, and we found that to be very useful. Um, and then also we have a shared resources shell in our LMS that is uh, where we put all of our materials and have really worked hard to organize that well. Okay, part of our community of practice is our new out faculty training. And they start off by going to an intro to out Canvas shell course. It takes one or two hours to do. We found kind of the hard way that if you give everybody the, uh, the fire hose method, the first day of training, they come away just blurry eyed and we're not sure they want to come back. So and in our intro to uh, shell course, um, that gives them the chance to do that at home and to go over uh, kind of the basics of how ALP works, what the basic tenets of ALP are, and just start to invest them in that. Um, and then we have a multi-day training. It's varies from two to three days. If I have individual app instructors, I might just have, um, you know, maybe several days that we spend over the summer just meeting one-on-one -on -one or in, in small groups to, to get them trained. But that time in between training is really important. And there we're focusing on the major pillars of ALP. And you can see how these are really attached to the Ripper skills. 
um, active learning, critical thinking, scaffolding, which is when you're trying to work ahead in the lower course to um, get students ready for their comp course. Um, backward design, which is related, and attention to non-cognitive factors, and the reading cycle, which we have really um, built up uh, after models we've, we've seen at conferences and very much based on um, the wicker skills. We need a lot of wicker skills in our, uh, the reading skills out of wicker in our reading cycle. Um, and let's see. Oh, and the other one I would say is missing is critical thinking and rigor. We put those together. And students do notice this pedagogy. Um, we have a survey at the end of the semester, always, where students fill out information that um, we want to get from them about what did you think about your semester and out. All sorts of questions. But one is, well, what kinds of strategies did your instructor use? And we list lots of things. But over and over again, they have always uh, listed active learning with groups and individually as the top choice. And so we feel like that reflects what's happening in the classroom without us even having to check on it all the time. That's really encouraging. And I wanted to point out at this point that um, we are going to go ahead and have a video link available to a, a video about Butler's Out program. So I think Kayla was going to go ahead and put that in the chat for us. So if you'd like to find out more about how Butler's Out program works, you can go ahead and watch that four to five minute video. So I'll close out the ALP portion by uh, referring again to the measure of success I mentioned earlier. As part of our partnership with AVID, it turned out to be natural for us to use our ALP classes as the primary experimental cohort because the training that those teachers had was intense and deep. So we also had a natural control group at the time, meaning all the students taking Dead Ed in English who were not in the ALP program, and we were able to compare those two groups. There were a lot of takeaways, uh, a lot of really positive results from that. Things like Kathy just mentioned about how students noted and recognized the difference in pedagogy and also impacts on their retention, for example, and then, of course, on their success in getting through Comp 1. But one that we're particularly proud of is this one that has to do with students participating more in peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and noticing it and reporting noticing their own improved critical thinking. Since those are just the sorts of things that we expect an active learning environment to accomplish, since those are just the sorts of transformations that we hoped that our pedagogical transformation at Butler would bring about, it means a lot to us that students made note of those things. And it's really, it can't be uh, overstated how AVID was able to support us in making that transformation here. So all the initiatives we've talked about so far had deep faculty development variety, you know, aspects to it. Kathy's communities of practice um, and Mark's faculty development events from Summer Jam to Second Saturdays, it wasn't just that we were rallying around the touchstone of the AVID strategies manual and book and, and ideas, but also the AVID supplied AVID coaches and on-site support uh, who, you know, people who were expert practitioners who came and modeled for us good ways to implement those trainings. And now, you know, that taught us good ways to tap into our own expertise so that we can do things like EdCamp or Second Saturdays that are for us, by us, in other words, and that's been another really important watchword of Mark's in, in faculty development. They showed us ways that we could come to own those strategies and implement them uh, in various programs ourselves. So uh, I'm about to advance now to a discussion of um, our pathways and the way, you know, our, our current pathways redesign and how that has been impacted by Abbott as well. But before I do, I'd like you to, uh, as members of the audience, think for just a minute about uh, challenges that you faced at your institution and how uh, various coordinated efforts have, uh, have worked to accomplish those kinds of goals. Um, and if you'd like, you can post those by adding them to the chat message that you see on the right.
And then if those uh, are posted and, and come across and we catch them, we'll refer to them as they seem relevant and helpful um, as, we, as, we, as we move forward. So we have, over the last two years, in what some might think of as an accelerated process, transformed Butler's ordinary organization of degrees and degree programs and departments um, according to the pathways model that has been used to some success by various colleges, four-year and two-year across the country. We are right now in our first semester of that new program that, above all, simplifies the decision-making processes for students uh, as they make decisions about what to enroll in and what kinds of professions they want to pursue and what kinds of academic routes lead to those, lead to those uh, professional ends. One central centerpiece for that project for us is a first-year seminar class that is required for almost all freshman students uh, in almost all meta majors, and that's our new term for uh, uh, for clusters of disciplines. So a good example of that would be the science, engineering, and math meta major. So all students in most meta majors must take this one credit hour first year seminar class that aims to orient them to those meta majors and also start supporting them in a more deliberate way in coming to make good decisions about what they want to be when they grow up systematically and also in terms of advocating for themselves as they uh, navigate higher education and its various complications such as um, enrollment and understanding what coursework leads to what degrees. This course, uh, we, have, we have good reason to think that the course itself will likely improve student retention for the reasons I just mentioned. I mean, and in addition to that, by helping emphasize and teach students ways to understand the relevance of all of their coursework, to help them come to articulate or be able to come to articulate how, wh why a course like Art Appreciation Day matters for them even if they want to be a dentist and it's not obvious why those are related. Um, we have good reason to think that this course can be successful because it's one, it's the latest incarnation of a series of courses that started when we first made our partnership with AVID several years ago uh, in 2013. Um, at that time, it was a small cohort of four or five classes that had you know, 20 students or so in them, and were students who were among Butler's most uh, least likely to succeed. In other words, um, since part of AVID's overall mission is to uh, reduce the achievement gap, we focused our AVID attention on students who were likely to fall into that gap. And uh, over the course of the next few years, that course evolved and worked its way into a niche that served all first semester dev ed students, in other words, students who tested as underprepared for college, English or math or both, and thus were taking developmental education courses such as those in our out program. All those students were required to take this three hour first year seminar class. And we found that um, more than on average, students who took that class and passed it were 20% more likely to be continuing on one year later which from our perspective at a community college is a really important measure. Um, it's one thing if they come back a second semester, but since the college, community college experience ideally is a two-year experience for most students, uh, it's really important to have them coming back one year later in that fall. So uh, we had this kind of success rate among students who were uh, among bus Butler's least likely to be retained, and we think that if we, ex if we uh, expand that to include other students in other uh, divisions, those who are non dead ed students, we can see some of those results as well. Um, here is a slide showing the various meta major courses that we have. Each of those, PD-121 through PD-129, is a meta major course where something like 60 to 80% of the content 
is uniform across meta majors and focuses on things like academic and self-awareness and certain kinds of study skills, as you might see in the left-hand column that shows the 12 modules uh, that we address in the 12-week course. Those courses each then have about 20 to 40 percent of their content orienting students toward that particular meta major, so they can continue to try it on for size. They can uh, perhaps be, uh, in this course about business and industry, taught by some expert in business and industry that can help them think through whether their aptitudes and their honest curiosities really do square with what's expected in business and industry. And they can start making subtle decisions about what area of business and industry, or in our, course, or in our college of terminology, what pathway or degree program they would ultimately thrive in best. All of these courses are blended courses, so that means that they do about half of the work online, cycling through 12 modules that emphasize the content described on the left. And then they meet once a week for an hour or an hour and a half, depending on the schedule, to have a teacher reinforce the ideas that they already learned, in, that they already encountered in those modules. All of those teachers have had an intensive AVID-oriented training so that they know exactly how to go about using active learning strategies or high engagement strategies or wicker-oriented strategies to emphasize those ideas in the classes. So <clears throat> our first results are not in yet because the semester hasn't finished, but our preliminary findings are that students really are advancing in their sophistication uh, about how they understand what the possibilities of college are and what its expectations are. We have really high hopes that we'll see a similar Im impact on retention that we have seen in the earlier incarnations of this class. And I should stress that in the training for this course, you know, we had a series of two-day trainings for all faculty. There are some hundred faculty who are trained to teach this course now. Um, we had AVID site support from AVID coaches who we've made a relationship with over the course of the last five years who are there to offer their expertise and their own training acumen, but also to support and assist, uh, you know, a partner in developing and implementing these trainings. So I think uh, I'd just like to say in conclusion that you probably can see that it has been an exciting time at Butler these last five years, and there's really no way to tell this story of our successful initiatives without also uh, giving props to AVID for higher education and the support that they've given over this time. I mean, it's partly about the AVID support they've given us. It's partly, you know, the, the site support and their AVID coaches. It's partly about the, the, the manual of research-backed engaged learning strategies that we've been able to rally around. But it's also about the way that working together with AVID helped us systematically approach um, coordinating the efforts of various offices on campus to do things in a way that has, that, that has fidelity to what um, the engaged learning is supposed to accomplish and also has legs and becomes entrenched in a way that isn't just a sort of one-off uh, flavor of the day like so many initiatives have, have been at Butler and um, I'm sure at other schools over the years. At this point, we'd love to answer any questions you have about, about this, and so I'm going to turn it back over to Kayla to introduce, the, or to Rob to introduce those questions. Well, first of all, thank you very much for that presentation, uh, Butler team. Uh, well done. Uh, we had uh, several questions that came in uh, from our attendees, uh, and one of them is, um, are, of course, they're interested in adjuncts, uh, the adjunct faculty, because that's always a challenge in terms of, of training uh, and finding time to train them. The question is, are your adjuncts paid to attend the Saturday workshops? Yes, they are. Uh, we have a stipend program, and uh, they are often 
uh, attending all of the Saturday trainings, even though we can only we have a cap on how much we can pay them for a year. So they tend to buy into the community of it all so much that the stipend is actually um, honestly secondary to their motive to come. It's it's safe to say that they they appreciate the camaraderie and community. They return um, even though. It's really a pittance what they can um, what they can earn by attending, and I think Kathy and I can both second something similar mm -hmm. a similar sentiment for our various projects. So Alp has adjunct instructors too; they've been required to do training. Do you want to say something about that? Right. Um, I found that um, having um, having the ability to offer them a stipend, uh, and with Alp, we do it just the first time they're trained, they get a, I think it's $200 to go through, if they go through all the different aspects of training and follow through in the semester, includes mentoring and that kind of stuff. Um, then after that, it's um, actually community, it's professional development points that they get, um, which uh, leads up to pay uh, eventually in, in Mark's program. Um, but to me, that kind of that carrot that we're willing to put our neck out and, and give some money towards that has really given um, given us some growth and movement in that program. Just to say kind of that they're valued, I think to me that's really important and then that's what they've done. So, um, and you have to have the support of your administrators to do that and to find that money, of course. So the money has been an important catalyst. There's no question about that. But I think an important takeaway is that, you know, that, that money was offered for a decade before uh, Mark started his faculty development revolution. <laughs> and, uh, and it really was not taken advantage of at all. It really amounts to building something that is worthwhile for people and wow. they crave that. Mm -hmm. They want quality support and, and they want to know that they're doing a good job and they feel like they're part of the institution. So um, in Kathy's case with ALP and in my case with the AVID first year seminar course for Pathways, I find the adjunct instructors really um, appreciate having somebody show them a good way to approach the things that they're supposed to do. They, like, they crave that training because it makes them feel like they're doing a better job. Thank you. We have another question uh, regarding training and specifically about Summer Institute. Were your summer jam leaders trained at the AVID uh, Summer Institute? Not all. Some, um, actually, I think our first year, not at all. But yeah. uh, in subsequent years, uh, some had gone to Summer Institute, and uh, otherwise, uh, uh, we just we just found a lot of talent in house and uh, um, um, exposed people to uh, high engagement strategies and. Um, I don't know, you were going to say well, I, I would at that first summer jam, we did have an avid coach come mm -hmm. and do a day's worth, if I remember right, a day's worth of mm -hmm. training. She, it was Debbie Shapiro who has been extremely helpful to us, and some of you may recognize your name because it's uh, on the author <laughs> uh, page of the Avid for Higher Education Teaching Strategies book. But uh, a lot of us then kind of at that point learned to model the way that we approached administering those kinds of trainings after people like Debbie and others from our community who had AVID experience such as uh, Bruce uh, Lawling. Bruce Lawling. Bruce Lawling who had been to the AVID Summer Institute. And then as we advanced, we were able to gradually over the course of that five years cycle more and more faculty through the Summer Institute. And uh, invariably they come away excited and inspired with things they want to try in their own classrooms and also things to report back and contribute to things like Summer Jam or the Second Saturdays. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we, the first year of implementation of anything is critical, and we have a question from a participant about that first year. What kind of training and support did you get during that first year, uh, and did you train a specific cohort of instructors in that first year? So in April of 2014, I believe it was, we had an in-service where all of our full-time faculty went through, I believe, five sessions of, uh, of basic orientation. So we had a session on Cornell Node, we had a session on active learning, we had a session on 
reading, and so on and so on. So all of our full-time faculty had uh, a full day exposure, and that was brought to us by our um, uh, Abbott support team. And, um, and, and then since that time, with the grant that we had to the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, we had, uh, I believe, at least two days of on-site support from the, from the AVID staff, and, and that's just been awesome. We've used that for, for leading some workshops, of course, but also for, um, like Corey alluded to, uh, background, planning, coordination, engineering. That's just made things really hum. Thank you. We have, I could add something to that, too. Part of the way that AVID support for us during that first year was organized is around the formation of an on-campus AVID site team mm -hmm. that I mentioned in passing earlier. And that's essentially um, a council that has representation from various uh, offices on campus, uh, from student services to um, finance and data to faculty development and, and others. And then AVID helped coach us through systematic ways of looking at various aspects of the institution and making action plans for how to breathe life into our efforts in each of those areas. Um, and so in addition to the on-site days of, of workshop administration and uh, support at faculty development, like Mark was talking about, we also had AVID organizers who came and helped um, let's get that council off the ground and, and help us um, create uh, workflows for doing the rest of that work. Mm -hmm. and, and we still use those. I mean, it's been a really uh, efficient and effective way to organize all of those approaches, and we are still, you know, working on advancing even in more and more advanced ways all the time each of the various areas that we identified as, um, you know, as efficacious in 2013. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly had that deep impact uh, across your campus, and the, the next question has to do with um, both faculty and, and staff. So how, how have you involved your learning center, uh, your academic success center, Tutoring Center and Writing Center staff in implementation of Abbott for Higher Ed. We have a, uh, a tutoring center on campus that is administered by a woman who has been to the Abbott Summer Institute and has been involved in all of our faculty development, Crystal Jackson. She has worked to implement um, Socratic tutoring methods in in that campus, uh, sorry, in that office, and over time has modified them to work in our particular environment. So that's one way. Um, you said learning centers, and what was the rest of your question? Yeah, the, the learning center, again, I think we di use different nomenclature on different campuses, okay. but you probably have a learning center or a success center. Writing. writing center, how have you engaged, really, engaged them? At Butler, we don't really have a learning assistance center. We don't have anything that really houses that. Um, you know, every campus is, every school is different that way. Um, we've just never developed that, um, and we've found other ways to, to meet those needs. Um, so tutoring, which is our peer tutoring program that Corey talked about, um, uh, is one way to carry out some of that. Um, also, we have, uh, we use the online writing lab that our English department um, runs, and we also uh, contract out a net tutor uh, for, just for students who don't use either or the other or have uh, classes that they need help in that aren't covered by the other. So um, we don't really have like a big on-campus learning assistance center. I think we also have a math lab, and so that's another reason. that I, So it's really more individually split out, I guess I would say. You know, this question uh, also points in the direction of, ex of ways that we have expanded our AVID methods and ways of organizing processes beyond just teaching and learning at Butler. So several administrative offices and, uh, and group meetings work to implement AVID strategies as their way of, or of, of organizing the, the agenda for a day, for example. And that's, 
really stuck in some places and has had a more fledgling start in others. But uh, it's important to, to uh, one success we had in, I think, about two years ago now was an administrative retreat where administrators and directors and deans and vice presidents from all over campus, I, I'm going to get the number wrong, but were there 100 people there? Yeah, 80 to 100. 80 to 100. Uh, uh, had a day and a half long retreat. Uh, we got off campus for it at a local country club. Um, which turned out to be the cheapest place, surprisingly. And uh, and there, uh, our avid site support person came, so it was, it was Christy Gertie, who I've gotten to know very, very well, came and helped us administer um, these day, this day and a half of marching all the administrators and vice presidents through avid-style learning strategies that helped us uh, launch our Pathways project. So this administrative retreat was at once a coming out party for the here we go on pathways mm -hmm. and also a here we go on avidizing every aspect of the institution. And it was a really, a really wild success. Mm -hmm. I mean, people came to have aha moments about what AVID offers them in their various corners of campus, um, especially with teaching and learning, but also with respect to organizing other kinds of student organizations and also administrative groups and organizations. So there's been a, a really important spillover effect beyond the classroom, and, and that's not accidental. I mean, I, I should say that one of the initiatives that the AVID site team has deliberately worked to develop a workflow about, flow about is uh, spreading these ways of thinking about organizing ideas and engagement <laughs> uh, elsewhere on campus, too. Thanks. That's, that's really important. I mean, I think all of us know that if we don't demystify and we don't engage our leadership, uh, then we're not going to sustain the work. And so what you did was, and I'm glad we were able to s support that, but that's really a critical piece of uh, any kind of implementation. Um, got a good question here that's kind of related to the previous one. What has been your campus leadership's reaction, including the Board of Trustees, somebody asked, uh, to the culture shift that's taken place at Butler? So, I think one um, indicator that there's been a lot of buy-in is that they've had us in on several occasions to do um, leadership training, communication training for the Dean's Council, uh, a couple of times with the Administrative Council. And then just last month, uh, some of us went to the Board of Trustees and uh, advertised it, and uh, uh, at least a half an hour of the time there. And uh, I think that the, the trustees in particular have had a lot more presence, and uh, and they're, they're they're better recognized by faculty more and more. And uh, to the point now, they are curious about the classroom, and they are eager to come into the classrooms and and see what this is all about. So I, I think it's been a big, um, it, a lot of progress has been made on that. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. They noticed. Yeah. yeah. So and that's a, that's really gr a great uh, step that you've taken. Um, this next question probably relates to the certification process. Uh, the question is, what's the ex expectation for the implementation, implementation of AVID, uh, and how is it monitored? I don't know the name of those reports, do you? <laughs> I can't think of the name. We have, we have a, uh, a complicated matrix spreadsheet uh, annual um, campus plan. That the we, campus plan. Yeah, the so campus yeah. plan that we have reviewed since I was a liaison back in 2013. and. Uh, it has a, um, somewhere around five major areas of focus. Right. One of them is uh, research uh, and, you know, institutional uh, IR, institutional research and support. One of them is related to um, student life and student uh, uh, support from tutoring and student life and other areas like that. The one I'm engaged in is, of course, faculty development and then academic leadership, that'd be the deans and so on. And so that has really, like Corey called it a workflow, and essentially it's been exactly that. It's given us a uh, chance to self-regulate and to see where we're at on the matrix as far as like where we are and where we'd like to be. And we just uh, every year review that and try to um, 
um, improve. Thank you. We're pursuing the carrot of becoming an avid demonstration school because we think that that will um, be something that separates us from area community colleges, especially with respect to recruitment in the Wichita area where AVID is really robust in high schools. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, aside from that, and, and Rob, you may be able to speak a little more precisely about this than I can, but it's not really a kind of process where we're required to do things to sustain a certification. From the beginning, AVID has been extremely generous about letting us use yeah. their, their name and adapt things our way and, you know, describe, use AVID materials um, um, and, you know, trumpet the fact that we are working on AVID and have AVID, um, AVID programs and features and, and pedagogy. Um, and when we, they do try to hold us to an annual calendar, but it's not in a punitive way. It's, uh, you know, when we, when we set those work goals for ourselves, those workflow goals for ourselves under their guidance and support, you know, if we don't make progress in some area, they will be more likely to help us figure out how to make more progress in that area than to um, reprimand us for doing something wrong. So it's not really the kind of system where we're, other than the, uh, the certification as an avid demonstration school, we're not, you know, beholden to uh, or responsible for them to maintain a certification. Uh, would you say that's right, Rob? Yeah, I, I think that we like to think we're not the avid police. Uh, <laughs> we do have, you, you guys know that we have, you know, the five essentials that you've uh, outlined that make up the certification at the higher ed level. And, and we also certify, of course, our elementary and secondary uh, programs as well. And it's a self-study. Uh, the notion is continuous improvement as opposed to punishment. So, but I do think the key components uh, of AVID for Higher Ed are represented in the, in the certification instrument, but we like the campus team to use it as a way of looking at continuous improvement. And I'd be happy to share with participants if they want to email me. Uh, Kayla's gonna send my email out with the slide deck. I can send a truncated version of the essentials, but it's been an important, Implementation with fidelity has been an important part of all of our approaches, whether we're talking about elementary, secondary, or higher ed. So that's kind of what we're known for. I'm going on a little long there. We have another last question. Um, this just came in. Do you folks see high school AVID students coming to Butler knowing that you guys are an AVID school? Is it a good recruitment tool? Hadn't thought of that one. Yes, it, it is a good recruitment tool. Um, right now, I don't think we have a clear way of quantifying the impact that it has on our recruitment, but we do have all kinds of anecdotal reports more and more every semester of students who will say, I already know Cornell Notes because mm -hmm. I was in AVID in high school. That doesn't mean they chose Butler because of its AVID, but we can ask them, and we do, did you know that Butler had AVID? And they would say, yeah, I heard that. Um, we, when we recruit at those schools, we talk about our work advertising it. Now, you know, that puts us in a position where we want to make sure that we can make good on that promise. And we think that once we accomplish that ultimate goal of becoming an avid demonstration school, that we'll be able to honestly promote that aspect of Butler more than we have been willing to do it in the past. But if it's any indication, um, a year or so ago, uh, an area school, a competitor of ours, was discovered to have AVID, the AVID logo on their posters, even though they weren't an AVID school. And they, they immediately got a cease and desist letter um, because they really knew that, you know, they, in, in their competition with us, they knew that we were offering AVID and they wanted to do that too. And, and I don't think AVID would turn them away if they wanted to make a partnership with them. It's just that they had not done that. <laughs> and uh, that indicates that there's a competitive advantage for it in our area. Okay. Um, I think we've pretty much come to the uh, end of our session. Uh, so for follow-up, all the, all the folks who registered are going to receive uh, the slide deck from Kayla, other follow-up materials. Uh, your contact information is on, will be in the slide deck so they can reach out to you for follow-up. My email will be in, in the slide deck. We'll be adding it to it. So uh, I really want to thank you folks 
uh, for the for your uh, presentation today, and, and thanks to the participants who stayed with us and sent questions in. So with that, I think I'll just say we're signing off, and uh, great work. Thank you, Butler Community College, and thanks to all of our participants, and we are out. Thank you.